I'm Tisha Bader and in the news, U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy's address this week to Israel's parliament, the Knesset, the second ever Speaker of the House to do so. What is its significance? What does it mean for U.S.-Israel relations? And how does it reflect Democrats and Republicans' stance on Israel? Well, to help us answer those questions is Washington Bureau Chief for the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, the JTA, Ron Campius, who joins us now from Virginia. Ron, thank you so much for being here with us on JBS. Thanks for having me. So you wrote an article this week uh, in the JTA about this, what you called landmark speech, which it is, of course. What is the significance and why McCarthy and why specifically now? Well, the significance is just is, first of all, I think that the U.S. Israel is there's, they're conveying a message that the U.S. Israel relationship is as strong as ever. Uh, well, the street, the speech itself, McCarthy's speech was completely nonpartisan. It uh it didn't take any even implied dings at Democrats or the Biden administration. McCarthy went out of his way to bring along a bipartisan delegation with him, including Steny Hoyer. They've both in the past been majority leader and uh, and and pulled them into every photograph and kept on talking about bipartisanship. So I think that's a, that's an important uh, message that they wanted to convey now at a time when there have been disagreements between Israel and the United States over a number of issues. Uh, particularly the uh, the judicial reform that uh, Netanyahu has paused in Israel, and also uh, issues having to do with the with the Palestinians. It's the seventy fifth birthday. They wanted to say underneath all that, there's still this very strong relationship. And I'll just quote um, from what McCarthy said, reflecting what you just mentioned. He said, "I chose to come here now today." to celebrate the bond between our two countries and to reaffirm that bipartisan support for Israel in Congress is at the foundation of our truly special relationship. Um, as you noted, very strongly stressing the bipartisan support and, and making it um, really one of the main focal points of his speech. So what do you just make of that aside from being a message of across the aisle support for Israel. Is there any other reason to sort of present that very strong support from Democrats, from Republicans as one at this time? Well, I mean, there have been tensions. There's like uh, the over, like I said, the, the judicial reforms. Uh, there was uh, uh, McCarthy during the speech presented a printed copy of a resolution that uh, the House passed last week uh, with 401 out of 435 members voting in favor, 18 voting against. That's like a, that's, that's what you call overwhelming, the very overused adjective that we like to use in a, in journalism, an overwhelming majority. But there were differences over that, um, that resolution. Uh, even though the vast majority of Democrats voted for it, uh, some of their, the, those who voted for it, even those who sponsored it, said that they were saddened that it admitted uh, the mention of a two-state outcome, a Palestinian and an Israeli state living side by side, uh, noting that five years ago, a similar resolution, these resolutions come every five years, so they had one for the 70th anniversary, one that was sponsored by a conservative Republican, uh, Virginia Fox at the time, did mention that. So there's this simultaneous growing apart about, for, between uh, Republicans and Democrats as to what pro-Israel means, but there's also like a, a desire to show that there still is a a very strong pro-Israel foundation uh, within the Congress on on a range of issues. Defense assistance, for for instance, one of them. He he, uh, you know, the uh, the United States is uh, going through a um, a whole debate now over the debt li debt limit and uh, to to what degree spending should be cut because of the debt limit. And uh, there were concerns when they when the Republican House passed a bill calling for across the board cuts last week that Israel might be affected. And McCarthy came out and said explicitly and absolutely no defense assistance for Israel won't be cut. So that's one area of broad agreement. I think they just wanted to get across at least that that they still had in common. Now, interestingly enough, you mentioned the judicial reforms, but McCarthy did not. He really didn't mention that issue, which again is a contentious one. So it makes sense that he didn't put it in his speech, but he did uh, say at a press conference later on, um, when asked about it, he said, Israel is their own nation. Israel can decide what they want to do. 
but I mean, he says, but I mean, having democracy, you want to have a check and balance. You want to have separation of powers. So he didn't say anything in his speech, but certainly what he said at the press conference later does signal his his stance and and the sort of perhaps a message to Prime Minister Netanyahu saying, you need to fix this. We support you. We'll, we'll, we're behind you 100 percent. This is something, though, that needs to be adjusted. Yeah, I think that was a that was very interesting in the press conference. I think that, uh, you know, in, in effect, uh, you know, President Biden, when he spoke a few weeks ago, he, he could have put ex- what he said in exactly the same words that uh, this is something that Israel needs to resolve for by itself, but democracies need checks and balances. It's important to preserve democracies. And I think that reflects the tensions. And what's, what's interesting about McCarthy saying it is that it shows that there's a broad cross-partisan concerns about it, even, the, uh, even as there's a desire to, to uh, let Israel uh, sort this out by, by itself. And it, it just makes sense. I mean, one of the things that Republicans cherish in this country is a separation of powers. Because uh, for four years you had, uh, or no, for, sorry, for two years, most recently you had a Democratic executive, a Democratic Congress, and the bulwark against uh, what the Republicans might have seen as excesses was an independent Supreme Court. Uh, and so even though the, the Supreme Court in, uh, that in Israel is liberal and you have conservatives who are trying to uh, alter it, they see the value, the basic value in the separation of powers. So in case that situation ever flips, you have a protection against uh, one side having too much power. And so what he chose to speak about instead, I mean, he mentioned the threat from Iran and some other issues that Israel faces, but Israel-China ties. Yeah. Can you explain that a bit, why that was sort of the, the thing that was, I don't know if it was the focus of the speech, but it was certainly emphasized. Yeah, I think, you know, it stood out. It, it, it stood out because everything else he said in the speech is what you would say if you were uh, a major politician speaking in the parliament of a very friendly country, just sort of how close you are. But that was the one difference he spoke about. And, it, you know, he didn't, it, it wasn't too pronounced in terms of his chiding, but there was chiding in there because he said that Israel could do more to uh, oversee uh, the, its uh, trade relations with China. And that's another issue that's, uh, that's United Republicans and Democrats. Uh, the Netanyahu in particular, but Israel generally has cultivated ties with China because it has massive markets and Israel is a growing economy and Israel has the kind of products that are useful to a, a developing any developing market in terms of high tech and other things. And Democrats and Republicans alike see China as a threat. They really, really, they're not happy with the uh, expansion of Chinese influence in uh, particularly in Africa, but also in Latin America and the Middle East. And in 2020, the Trump administration did something that it very rarely did. It made public a difference it had with Israel over plans then uh, by a Chinese company to uh, control a port in Haifa, plans that uh, Netanyahu had kicked into, uh, helped kick into place. And so that's something that I think that really, as things are, are getting more tense on the world stage, you, you know, the locus, I think, of the uh, the East-West confrontation is now Ukraine-Russia. China seems to be siding more and more with Russia, and it's also looking at what Russia did to Ukraine and seeing it perhaps as a template for what it could do to Taiwan. Taiwan is uh, is an absolute red line for the United States for both parties, and uh, that just it seemed it was important for him to put that message out. Interesting, and McCarthy's visit, of course, follows a visit um, just the week a week prior by House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, who also came to Israel. He didn't address the Knesset, but he met with Netanyahu. He, he met with Israel's President Isaac Herzog, and you know, also sort of making that statement of, this is the eve of Israel's 75th birthday. We're showing our support, our, our bipartisan support. So these two visits coming at this time with all these other things also, not just Israel's 75th anniversary, but of course the judicial reforms, the end of Ramadan, conflicts with the Palestinians, all these other things that are also happening. So when you look at Jeffrey's visit and McCarthy's visit, do you kind of see them as both coming with the same, the same reasoning, the same significance? Yeah, and I think you know there's also a, there's always a political aspect to this. Uh, it's it's interesting because. 
to the degree to which there's been a battle over the Jewish vote in the past few years has most focused on domestic issues. Uh, you know, what? how does one define, how does one uh, confront anti-Semitism, that kind of thing. They're going back, it's almost nostalgic for me from 20 years ago. They're going back to the to making Israel uh, uh, the issue. And I think that uh, both sides really want to show that they're 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 pro-Israel. I think that they have uh, constituents. I think Hakeem Jeffries kind of had something to prove because CNN unearthed op-eds he'd written when he was a uh, a student at um, at the State University of New York, I think, where he he expressed support for his uncle Lionel Jeffries, and he expressed for support for Louis Farrakhan. And he didn't outline. He didn't. He didn't actually cross into anything. He didn't say anything about anything Jewish. But obviously, both those figures were very controversial. Uh, within the Jewish community. And since then, he is, uh, as a politician, he has emerged as very much pro-Israel. He's got a New York constitu constituency. So he wants to he wants to make sure that that gets across. And similarly, um, you know, the Republicans uh, and Kevin McCarthy are just want to make sure that their pro-Israel bona fides are in place, because that's also important votes. It's important vote-wise. Florida has trended Republican. The Jewish voter there has also defied expectations and become more Republican. It's still majority Democrat, but it become more Republican. They want to nurture that kind of thing. They've also got uh, pro-Israel voters in the Christian community they want to please. And of course, there's the donor community, also very important uh, in terms of pro-Israel money going to the parties. So to expand on that a little more, you wrote another article um, on the JTA about how, even though there is this bipartisan support, we're also seeing Democrats and Republicans, you wrote, use Israel as a wedge issue. Can Correct. you talk about that a little bit more and explain what you mean? Well, like I said, they are each accusing each other of not being pro-Israel enough. And so, you know, like I said, uh, McCarthy's speech to the Knesset was absolutely nonpartisan. He did indulge in a little bit of partisanship outside the Knesset in his press conferences in a in an interview with the Israeli daily Israel Hayom, where he chided Biden for not agreeing yet to meet with Netanyahu. And Biden's not terribly happy with Netanyahu now, even though they have a friendship that goes back 40 years. And so he's not invited him to the White House yet. It's kind of a convention to invite an Israeli prime minister soon after his election to the uh, the White House. And uh, and McCarthy said, well, if he doesn't, if Biden doesn't invite Netanyahu to the White House, I'm gonna invite him to Congress. Uh, Democrats are seizing on the, uh, the funding cuts I spoke about. Uh, they're saying, you have to make explicit that uh, assistance for Israel and foreign assistance is sacrosanct when you're talking about spending um, cuts and they haven't, Republicans haven't done enough to do that. Uh, you know, it's kind of, it's political. If you look at the actual bill that was passed last week, there's very little specific in it. In fact, uh, the Republicans kind of left themselves vulnerable because there are people coming from all sides. Uh, Democrats are sort of attacking them from all sides and saying that you're not Oh, what are you? What are you going to cut defense? Or are you going to cut uh, veterans administration? And Republicans saying we haven't said what we're going to cut. But when you uh, when you're the side who's proposing cuts, you become vulnerable in that sense. And Democrats are seizing on that uh, in terms of Israel assistance and uh, and other things. What do you make of the fact that President Biden said he was not inviting Netanyahu at this time? Do you think it's just a combination of things? We have the judicial reforms. We have the fact that he has several people in his government, like. Itamar Ben Gvir, uh, Salil Smotrich, that are controversial, very much on the far right. Is it mostly those things, or is there something else going on? What do you, what do you make of that? I don't know if I don't know. I think it's mostly those things. I think you know one thing that uh, that everybody's mentioned is that Israel and the United States have not just continued but intensified their military cooperation. They've had joint exercises. It's still critically important to the United States. It has been for decades. Uh, to to present to Iran the uh, the idea that it has a, a robust partner, and it's you know it's interesting because sometimes sometimes in the U.S. media that's cast as uh, the, you know the, the U.S. wants to get across the message that it's protecting Israel. That's not exactly what it wants to get across. It wants to get across to Iran that we are a presence in the Middle East that you cannot disrupt oil transfers in the Middle East. You can do not disrupt. Uh, other allies in the Middle East, including Saudi Arabia, and our best and most robust ally is Israel. And so we're going to conduct joint military exercises with them to get across that message. So I, I don't think that, you know, as far as that goes, that's going strong. I do think it very much, you saw Betzalel Smotrich come to the United States, completely snubbed, completely boycotted. Nobody would meet him. The word went out, do not meet him. Even if you're, you know, he's the uh, finance minister, his counterparts would be in the treasury 
you know, from the highest to the lowest in the treasury, nobody, no official would agree to meet him. I think that's a big concern for Biden. Those uh, those types of figure, that types of uh, that type of ideology, uh, especially what happened after um, Hawara and the West Bank, in which there was uh, two Israeli brothers were murdered, and then there was a uh, a rush on the town by by nearby settlers, and they burned down houses and they burned down cars. And uh, Smotrich appeared to support that, at least in concept. Uh, Bibi wants, sorry, Biden wants, I think, Netanyahu to separate himself from that that kind of thinking and that kind of ideology. Makes sense. And Ron, just from your coverage um, over the last few months about the judicial reforms and sort of the effect on U.S.-Israel relations, what would you say the status is right now? And, and what do you make of what's been happening over the last few months? I think that, yeah, it seems to me that the more, every time I see rhetoric coming from Netanyahu and the judicial reforms, he wants them to go, he wants them to go away. He wants, I think he's, uh, he's figured that he's had enough, uh, that the, the, the people who want the reforms have had enough successes so far going forward for, with them now would be massively disruptive. You've seen, you know, the massive protests against them. You've seen how it's been affecting U.S. Israel, the U.S. Israel relationship. He put them on pause. He says that, about now, actually, he said in the May, in May he would get back to them after negotiations. My sense is that if he can figure out a way to maneuver out of doing anything about them, that's what he uh, he wants to do, and that way he would get back uh, rolling with the U.S. Israel relationship. And uh, you know, what's critical to him is the um, is bringing more countries into the Abraham Accords, particularly Saudi Arabia. He doesn't want anything to get in the way of that. And you're already hearing noises from the the, the parties who who back the reforms, uh, specifically people like Itamar Van Nuveer, saying that no, they want the reforms to go ahead, otherwise they they could bring down the government. So what we'll see, it's it's kind of open ended right now. And what's interesting also is that, you know, the you mentioned the protests and just this amazing display of democracy, which President Biden has noted, and many people in the U.S. administration, um, you know, making a careful distinction sort of between we're, we're seeing democracy at, at work here with the, with the people out in the streets and that there may not always be agreements with, you know, Israel's leadership, but this is kind of, this is a process that we, that we encourage, that we embrace. Oh yeah, for sure. I think, uh, you know, this is galvanized uh, a lot of, in a, in, in a way it's galvanized in maybe ways that we're not going to be seeing yet, but I kind of see undercurrents of it. It's galvanized sympathy and and admiration for Israel, at least in the Israel in the U.S. Uh, political establishment, uh, that you could have, uh, you know, such a robust uh, uh, showing of uh, of opposition, and you and you even have like what's what's also like it could be you could see more of it. You, I think Americans could want it would want to see more of this here. You also have the sides listening to one another. So you had you have Galant, the uh, the defense minister, saying, you know, maybe we should put a pause in the protest. And at first, Netanyahu was, "I'm firing you," and the next day he was, "Okay, maybe you're right. There should be a uh, uh, a pause on the um, on the I'm sorry on the uh, on 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 the judicial reforms." And so it's it's a country in which people still listen to each other. People still see, I mean, you know, and and Netanyahu reflects this very much in his rhetoric. He sees the other side as patriots. Uh, and he calls them patriots, and uh, and I think that that is is, is sowing uh, a lot of admiration here from people who like had forgotten that this was a uh, part of the face of Israel, profound disagreement, and um, and efforts to resolve that disagreement. And it's also interesting, I think, just the 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 faces of Israel you see at the protests, right? This is not just like one specific group of of a specific. Israeli, let's say, um, the protests really saw people from all streams of Judaism, from religious and secular, old and young, um, you know, really just across a lot of different sectors of Israeli society wrapped in Israeli flags, you know, giving this very strong message that we love our country, we're doing this, we're fighting for our country. That's why we're here. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I've seen liberals online on Twitter and social media saying, why can't we do this in the states. Why don't we wrap mm. ourselves in the U.S. flag? Mm. But that's very much it. You're you're right. I mean, the the protests have been awash in Israeli flags, and I think that also sends a, a very strong message. What is your take, or what is your hope at the moment? When you look, these talks have been ongoing. President Herzog, who who has really come out as you know, he always 
sort of, I think, gave this very much voice of reason image, right? He, he seems to be very middle of the road, very centrist, very calm presence, but I really feel like he took um, the spotlight in this situation in, in the most positive way possible. What are your hopes and, and what are the realistic outcomes? Do you think that an agreement can be reached that will, obviously it's tough to find something that will make everybody happy, but at least a situation that is acceptable by, by each side more, more or less? Uh, I think that the uh, you know it, I'm I'm not sure exactly what the what the precise formula will will be going out. I know that Benny Gantz, uh, one of the opposition leaders, put out a kind of a mixed message where he thinks that the, uh, the 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 feeling in the room is great, but nothing's happening. So you have like you have that kind of contradictory message. You know, one possible outcome is that people have said one of the reasons you have this crisis. Uh, one of the reasons this was precipitated by the Supreme Court in the 1990s is that Israel doesn't have a constitution and it doesn't have a means of protecting vulnerable populations. And so the Supreme Court was going to stand as that bulwark and and uh, and protect vulnerable pop populations. So one, one way you could get this going is to actually go through the painful, difficult process of starting to write a constitution. And that will put like a bunch of people in a room, probably technocrats, uh, not necessary politicians, to work this out and that for an extended period and then that takes it off the table it reduces a lot of the tension in the streets and uh i don't know to what degree that people who want the reforms are going to buy that or have you know they they might see that as a defeat they might not want to buy that but that's possibly one way out interesting well we will have to wait and see and hopefully have you back on jbs to talk more about this as we continue to follow this, the judicial reform story, and of course, always keeping our eyes on U.S.-Israel relations and um, and the politics of it, and the uh, let's say the, the the human face of it. When we see people like McCarthy, when we see people like Jeffries coming to Israel, visiting Yad Vashem, visiting the Kotel, and and giving a very strong message of of support. So, uh, hope to have you back on to continue this conversation. Thank you, I hope to be back on. Thank you so much. Ron Campius is Washington Bureau Chief for the JTA, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. We thank him so much for his time today and for joining us on JBS. And thank you as always to our director, Sloan Copeland, transmissions manager, John McDevitt, technical manager, Michael Paley, and producer, Carol Lilienthal. And thank you for watching In the News.